Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about several related topics uh, and they'll all kind of merge together at the very end. So we'll talk about default properties, complex properties, and the property element syntax. And then we'll talk about how an intelligent XAML parser really saves us from extra extraneous XAML code because it can infer uh, the the relationships between the elements uh, by their context. So we'll talk about that at the very end. But before we get started here, I just want to point out kind of the containment relationship that we see in our XAML. Since XAML is essentially an XML document, we can embed elements inside of other elements. And that again, kind of implies a containment relationship. So you can see that we have a page object and inside of the opening and closing page uh, page tag, we have a grid object. And inside of the opening and closing grid element, we can see that there's both a button and a text block. Now, what's really going on behind the scenes, and we don't see this uh, in our XAML, is uh, what's actually kind of more the proper parlance in XAML is that the page's content property is set to a new instance of the grid control. And the grid control has a collection called children. And here we're adding two instances of control to that children collection. So again, uh, we don't see those properties listed anywhere here. So if you take a look, we don't see a content property listed among the other properties. We don't see a any mention of children here in the grid control. But what is going on behind the scenes is that we're populating those properties. And I'll explain why we don't see them in our XAML again at the very end of this lesson. But for now, just understand there's a little more than meets the eye. We're actually setting the, uh, the grid's children property uh, and we're setting the pages content property. Now, if you take a look at the C-sharp version of our code, it, it more accurately shows that relationship between the layout grid. It has a children collection of, of controls and we're adding to that children collection an instance of the button. Okay, we just don't see that here in our XAML. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind. We're gonna come back to that in just a moment. Let's talk for a moment about uh, default properties. So depending on the type of control that you're working with, the default property for that control can be populated by using this embedded style syntax where we have elements inside of elements. Now in the case of, for example, the button control, the content property happens to be the default property for that control. So I can remove that property from the, uh, from the properties or the attributes of that element. And then I can also just remove that self-enclosing uh, syntax there for the element and just create a proper closing tag for the button. So we have an open button tag and a closing button tag with nothing inside of it, but we can add something like hello world inside of it and now by using that default property syntax, we can actually see in the design view that we've changed the content property for the button, okay? So that will come to bear here in just a moment as well. Keep that in the back of your mind. Let's go back to the XAML uh, editor for our main page and uh, let's talk about type converters just for a moment. You recall from the last lesson, we talked about uh, type converters and I really at that time only mentioned some simple type converters. For example, the horizontal alignment property. Here, that particular property is adorned with an attribute that the developers of this property uh, decided to create a type converter so that we can just give it a literal string value and it will perform the type conversion to an instance of uh, an enumeration windows UI XAML horizontal alignment dot left and the same holds true this simple type converter for the vertical alignment as well. Now there are some more complex versions of type converters like we see here in the margin. Here our margin property in XAML is set to a literal string of 20 comma 20 comma 0 comma 0 and if you take a look at the background property it also is set to just a simple string a literal string of red. But if you take a look at the C-sharp version, there's a little bit more going on here. The type converters have to work a little bit harder than they did with the horizontal and vertical alignment. In the case of the margin, notice that we're just not 
giving it an enumeration, but we're actually creating a new instance of an object called thickness. And that thickness has a constructor that accepts four input parameters uh, that happen to be the, um, uh, the left margin, top margin, right margin, bottom margin. Likewise, if you take a look at the background property here, we're actually setting it to a new instance of an object called a solid color brush and we're passing in as the uh, as an input parameter to the constructor a enumeration of type windows.ui.colors.red. So in these cases, they're a little bit more complex than the previous cases we looked at. However, uh, there's still even a additionally more difficult situation. In, in some situations, uh, there are properties uh, and values that you set to those properties that are simply too complex to be represented merely by type converters or handled by type converters. So when a controls property is not easily represented by just a simple uh, XAML attribute like we see in these examples that we've been looking at, then it's referred to as a complex property. So to demonstrate this, I actually want to remove this background color uh, here. We're going to remove it. And we're also going to remove this uh, default property and I'll reset the content property here back to what it was. I think it was just click me. All right. And then finally, I want to go over here to the main page. I'm going to comment this out just so we don't accidentally uh, get some results. We're not expecting if I happen to decide to run it. Okay. Let me go ahead and add that closing. Okay. Now we're good to go. All right. So now what I want to do is put my mouse cursor on the button. Uh, so that when I look in the properties window, the name is set to click me button. That lets me know that I'm, I'm in the right context for the properties uh, window. And I want to set that background property again using the property um, dialog here. And I want to change the background property. So I'm going to make sure to select that. Now, since we removed it in the XAML, our background property is not being set at all. And what I want to do is change that to a gradient brush. And a gradient brush is just going to give us a gradient. As you can see right now, the gradient starts out as black and then it, uh, it slowly fades into the color white. Now, if you look at the XAML that was generated, we see that quite a bit has been added to our project between the opening and closing button tags. Here we're setting the button background property to an instance of linear gradient brush. So whenever you see this type of syntax, this type of element embedded inside of another element, this is called the property element syntax, where we have an object dot property. And what your intent is, is to give it some additional XAML inside of that, that property element syntax uh, that will define the values for this complex property. Now, what is a linear gradient brush? It's simply uh, just, again, kind of think of a paint brush. Uh, so whenever you see the term brush, you're just thinking about color or colors. In this case, we're looking at a paint brush that can paint a color starting at the top of the wall at black. And by the time we paint the bottom of the wall, it'll be white. Okay. Now let's actually change this. I'm going to put my mouse cursor back up here in the button. And I'm going to come back here to the property window. And I don't want it to go... Um, from black to white, I want it to go from black to red. So there's a little circle in this upper left-hand corner. I'm just gonna drag it all the way here to the right-hand side. And notice that it changed the gradient stop from white, the color white to the color red. Now let's save that and take a look at what it looks like here in the designer. And you can kind of see how that's represented. At the top of the button is black, the bottom of the button is red, great. Now, honestly, you probably never, ever want to do this because it just doesn't follow the same aesthetic as the rest of the applications that your users are going to see in Windows 10. But let's pretend for now that uh, you want to express your individuality or there's some branding that you want to do that uh, your company is known for and you need that, that uh, gradient. Okay, so you can see that as we go back to the XAML editor. If you do want to define a linear gradient brush, you have to supply quite a bit of information here. You have to not only give it the colors that you want to use, you also have to give it a collection of gradient stops and their offsets where, the, uh, where one color starts and the other color stops. Okay. While this does look like a lot of additional XAML just to represent a color, 
uh, the the code snippet here that I have highlighted is actually shortened automatically by Visual Studio. Let me take just a moment here and type out what the full XAML should be if Visual Studio didn't try to compact it for us, okay? So give me just one moment here. Okay, so it took me a moment or two, but you can see that I've added a couple lines of code here in line 23 and 24 and then the closing tags in lines number uh, 28 and 29 here, okay? And so you'll see that we're setting the buttons background to a new instance of the linear gradient brush class. The linear gradient brush class has a property called gradient stops. The gradient stops property is of type gradient stop collection. So we create a new instance of gradient stop collection and add two instances of the gradient stop object to that collection. Okay, so as you can see that uh, we were able to omit lines 23, 24, as well as 27 or rather uh, 28 or yeah, 27 and 28. And we were able to omit this, or actually Visual Studio, when it generated the XAML for us, was able to uh, omit it because it wanted to make the XAML more concise and more compact, and it's made possible by an intelligent XAML parser. So first of all, we talked about default properties at the very outset of this lesson. Uh, the gradient stops property is the default property for the linear gradient brush. The, linear, the gradient stops property is of type gradient stop collection. So the only thing that we can put in a gradient stop collection are instances of gradient stop. So since we just put two gradient stop objects inside of a linear gradient brush, it knows that we're dealing with the default property and that default property is of type gradient stop collection. So we don't even need to put that in there. That's already implied. We can just supply it. Whoops, gave it the wrong thing here. We can just give it the two gradient stops and it can infer the rest that it needs from its context, okay? So the moral of the story is that the XAML parser is intelligent and it doesn't require us to include redundant code that it can infer from the context. As long as it has enough information to create that object graph correctly, it'll do it and we don't have to give it any more than it needs. And furthermore, Visual Studio will uh, emit concise code if we use uh, the properties window or other tooling support inside of Visual Studio. So just to recap this lesson, we talked about a number of different things, again, that all kind of fit together. We talked about default properties, we talked about complex properties, then we talked about the property element syntax like we saw here, and like we saw, we've actually removed some of those uh, lines of code uh, between line 22 and line 25. And we also talked about how an intelligent XAML parser allowed us to remove those lines of code because it allows us to keep our XAML compact by inferring from context what inner elements should be used for. And finally, whenever possible, Visual Studio will generate concise XAML for us, okay? So let's keep plugging along with more XAML in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thank you.